way. So when we called request.get, we gave it a string and then we said params equals this dict. So we named one of the parameters, but we did not name the other parameter. And so you have to do that the same way for this assert to pass. Um, yeah, so it, yeah. Okay. Um, there's also call args. So if you need more flexibility, um, for example, maybe you want to make some matchers, you want to um, really just dig into what the call arguments were and only look at a couple of them or something. Um, we have this call args attribute. Um, if you want to compare against call args, what you used to have to do is create this call wrapper around the parameters you wanted to compare against. That or like index into call args and you ended up with this like really gross looking code, but we have new in Python 3.8, um, these args and quargs attributes on top of call args so that you can access them in a much prettier way. Okay, we have three minutes left on the last part. Um, okay, async. So async, you know, everyone's writing asynchronous Python. Um, it's very awesome. So this is just a rewrite of our previous get username function to be asynchronous. So it's now async def instead of def. Um, we're putting it in a client session instead of doing request.get. Um, we're awaiting everything. So this is our asynchronous version of that function. So how do we test this? The way we test it is with async mock. So unit test.mock added async mock in Python 3.8. So when you do this patch decorator thing, um, you want to include new callable equals async mock. And that tells it that your mock should not be a magic mock, it should be an async mock. And then every time you create a mock, you basically just wanna make it an async mock again. Um, and so that will let you do your test asynchronously. So yeah, basically we have, you know, we create our async mock, we set the parameters on it all in the exact same way. And then we call get username with a wait because that's how you call asynchronous functions. Um, and this test works. So the only thing I want to add is we have this pytest.mark.asyncio decorator in here. So what what is that? So we didn't really talk about pytest, but it's a really common way of running your unit tests. Um, so if you are using pytest and you have some asynchronous unit tests, they are not going to work by default because um, you can't call asynchronous code from synchronous code. So in order to make sure PyTest is running your async tests correctly, you add this decorator to your test and then PyTest has just got it from there. It knows exactly how to handle it once you have that decorator. Okay, um, thank you so much for joining Pajamas Comp. Um, it was great to meet you. Um, this is pre-recorded. I didn't meet you, it was still great. Um, but yeah, so feel free to connect with me online if you have further questions. I'm on Twitter, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, have a fantastic December. For, for later viewing on the, oh yeah, thank you very much. Uh, try this again. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks uh, for the talk, Jesse. We've had minor technical problems, but so far we didn't have to click on our pre-prepared uh, technical problems picture, which would have been this. But um, no, nope, we're still on track for this, so things are working. And we are also almost on time. And our next uh, speaker is a live speaker, so at least the video is not going to mess up. And um, He's the CIO of Mousepaw Mouse Media. It's Jason McDonald's, the author of the upcoming book, That Simple Python, and he's always the joy to talk to. So, Jason, welcome. <laughs> and hey, let's see if we can it's hear something. Yes. Hey. Um, oh. Do, yeah, do you have uh, we're still alive here. So, after, like, I can hear you perfectly. That's, it, it's, it's working. Okay, good, good, good. All right, let's 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 see if the screen share works now. Let's so the next thing, the screen share will work uh, probably because I will click add to stream now. And Yay! Uh, Yay! as you can see, uh, it, it's so nice. So um, as we are already one minute over the planned starting time, I will let you get through this uh, right away. Uh, start with uh, you're thinking about objects wrong. 
There you go. <laughs> and so is everyone else. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I was preparing for this over the weekend, and I decided I hated my slide deck, so I deleted it, and I went ahead and just went with Visual Studio Code for this. This is a new thing for me. So um, uh, I probably don't need to reintroduce myself here. Um, so I'll just get into it to save some time. Um, as Martin mentioned, though, I, I am the CEO lead developer at Mousepaw Media, and it's worth mentioning that um, I have been training interns for quite a, quite a number of years. So a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm going to be talking about is based on teaching them how object-oriented programming was supposed to work. Uh, because the thing is, if we want to find someone to blame for thinking about objects wrong, blame university-style Java. Uh, it's, it's not Java itself. It's the way the universities teach it, and it's kind of... Uh, just kind of replicated over the past, you know, twenty some odd years, um, and it's it's a very backwards way of of thinking about the problem. See, the problem is we missed Alan Kay's point when he started talking about object oriented programming and objects in general. Um, we we kind of misunderstood what he was getting at, uh, but thankfully we can correct it with the existing tools we have, especially in Python, um, because. Um, it's not really a change in tools; it's a change in thinking. So, uh, you can you already know all of these techniques. I'm not really going to show you any new techniques today. Probably, uh, maybe it'll be new for some people, but most of this you probably already know. Uh, but if you're more more advanced developer and you're watching this, stick around because I, I am going to actually make an immutable class at the end. So, <laughs> if you've been wondering how to do that, I'm going to show you. Uh, and as, as Martin mentioned, I'm also the author of Dead Simple Python, which is I love that book cover. That that just makes me happy right there. Um, so Dead Simple Python is a book all about um, the uh, learning the Python programming language when you're coming from another language. So like C++ or, or what have you. Uh, JavaScript or Ruby or Java. And so it helps you learn idiomatic Python. And I, I there's some stuff in here that I learned in the process of researching it. So even if you've been doing Python for, you know, what, 10 years, you'll, you'll still learn something from this. So. Uh, this is coming up May 2021 from No Starch Press. Very excited for that. Uh, also, all my notes are going to be on GitHub. So you can find them at github.com, codemouse92, talk underscore thinking about objects. I'll stick this into uh, Discord later as well. All right. So I'm going to cover three different components of, or I'm going to basically tackle this problem of objects from three different angles. Um, and uh, those angles are blueprint, boundaries, and behavior. Blueprint, boundaries, and behavior. So starting with blueprint being software architecture. Alan Kay, in a message to the Squeak mailing list back in October 1998, said, I'm sorry that I long ago coined the term objects for this topic because it gets many people to focus on the lesser idea. The big idea is messaging. Um... Messaging is kind of what I'm going to be focusing on here, largely. Messaging is the key of how you need to be approaching object-oriented programming. And the cool thing is this means it's no longer at odds with functional programming. You can do functional patterns with objects uh, as long as you bear this in mind, as you're going to see. But see, the problem is tutorials have historically tricked us into flipping the logic, which is where we get this university-style Java from. Because we all learned object-oriented programming basically the same way. So I'm just going to kind of throw up an example here. Uh, so <clears throat> we've all seen this terrible thing. Uh, we're we're going to create a class, you know, boys and girls, as uh, called animal. And, and then we're going to get more specific and we're going to create a cat, which inherits from animal. And uh, um, it's going to have a name. And so we're going to name the cat. Uh, and the cat needs to be able to meow. And so we'll say print meow. Help if I can spell. Uh, and it needs to be able to eat. So we'll have it eat food. Um, and uh, we'll use an F string to be trendy here. Uh, eats food. Great. Okay, so now we can create our cat. And our cat's name is Fluffy. And the cat meows. And the cat eats uh, salmon. Okay, this is insipid. My, my soul burns with this example, if I'm totally honest with you. If I just run this. Okay, meow, and it eats salmon. Okay, it's cute. It's also wrong. 
is that we've I've immediately gone completely off the rails in terms of how object oriented programming is actually supposed to work. Uh, because the, when you're writing tutorials, this flips the logic on it on its head, and it's a it's a solution in search of a problem. And of course, part of that's because writing tutorials is hard. I just spent two years doing it with with this book. Uh, you know, writing examples is very difficult because you have to think, what do I want to teach, and how do I present that? So, what problem can I use? Um, which can be annoying. So, uh, to get around that, then. Um, Sorry. We have to think about the design of the behavior of the code first. Forget classes. Design the behavior of the code first. So let's get this out of our site. And I'm gonna I'm gonna build an example here. I gotta delete these. I'm gonna I'm gonna rework these. Um so let's let's bring this up here. So we have um we have uh, this this animal adoption scenario I'm going to build. Present animals who are up for adoption and then automate the adoption process. Most of this is going to be stub functions, but you know, bear with me here. So I need to think about what do I actually want this code to do? Um, well, I want to be able to do two things. I need to be able to display animals, and I want to be able to adopt an animal. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, uh, let's see. Display animals. This is where objects come in. We have to think about objects as units of state. Objects are messages by K's description or units of state if you're thinking about functional. Uh, so we start thinking about the messages that we need to pass between the functions. So for example, we have display animals um, and we have a, a list of, of animals, we'll just call it adoptables. Um, we need to have... Um, to be able to adopt an animal. Uh, self uh, animal, or not self, what's wrong with me? Animal adopter, and we'll say adoption pool. Okay. Um, and then when we adopt an animal here, we need to verify the adopter. Um, we need to process the, the, the payment for all the adoption expenses. That's also on the adopter. So those are the that's the message we're passing, as it were. We need to register the animal. So we need to register an animal to an adopter. And we need to mark adopted um, some animal. Okay, so I have these here. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and put these up here. Oh, it'd help if I could type today. There we go. And we'll just make those blank for the moment. But we have our we have our stubs here, and uh, this is now demanding some things. So let's just pass none for the moment. There's only one argument on the first one, not three. Okay. So if I run that, so the important thing here. Um, is that classes are not an organizational structure. We're thinking about this behavior uh, without regard to classes whatsoever. And um, uh, it's it's running. It doesn't do anything yet, but it runs. Uh, so we're thinking about, uh, about the behavior first. Now we can start thinking about the messages, that is the classes, because uh, the uh, classes are defined by their constituent data. So... I'm going to go ahead and create one of these. We have to have an animal. So an animal, let's think about what the constituent data is for this. An animal needs to have, let's see. Uh, let's do our initializer. Um, it needs to have a name, a gender, an age, a breed, and a species. I'm going to just quickly turn these into attributes here. So. Control D to, whoops, let's select one of these commas. Control D to select all my commas. And give me my multi cursor. And then I can do extend my multi cursor there and copy that self dot name equals. One other attribute I want to be able to add in here is notes. I want to be able to store some notes, but we're going to figure that part out later. Uh, but I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna supply it now. Where am I? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So this is this is our animal class here. 
Um, one of the important things to note is that the constituent data is going to inform the structure. It doesn't actually have to be a class. Could it be a dictionary? Could it be a named tuple? Hey, don't cringe. They're neat. Could it be a data class? Um, so example of, of one with a data class, let's, let's take a look at adopter. Um, this adopter, you know, I, I don't really need to do anything special with this. I just need a few pieces of information. That's all I really need. So data class is a good fit for this. So a data class, and this just creates an ordinary class, um, you know, with this data class uh, decorator. There's some cool features with this if you read the docs. But I'm just going to create a few fields. And these are all going to wind up being instance attributes once the decorator does its magic. So there's an adopter. I have name, government ID, address, phone number, email. Pretty simple. Um, I know that I don't need anything more because this is just an adopter. I don't need any special functionality on this. So I have my adopter. Um, another common mistake that we make when we're structuring code, though, is we start thinking about, well, how can inheritance work its way into it? Again, it's because of how we're taught. You know, we, we think somewhere instinctively along the way, well, you know, we have cats and dogs. So we, should, we should create a cat uh, class, and we should create a dog class. Okay, here's the problem. This doesn't help us. In this example, the cats and the dogs don't really have any additional data. We say, well, they have additional behavior, but that's exactly the problem. It, inheritance needs to extend the meaning, not just the behavior, because, again, classes are defined by their constituent data. Everything's about the data. It's all about the data. So we don't need to do that. Now, inheritance does come in handy in many ways. Let's make adoptable stop pi. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here. There's really no major need for this, but, you know. Um, I'm going to use an abstract base class and make an adoptables class. And the reason I'm making this is because I'm expanding on the meaning. I'm expanding on the data. It's not just a collection. It's a collection of animals that are up for adoption. Um, so I can foresee some additional uh, ways I need to work with that data, um, some additional attributes of that data. But, you know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of guilty of finding a, 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 a problem to fit the solution here. But... Um, you know, I only have 25 minutes. Nope, that's supposed to be a list. So I'm going to create a collection here, and it's got adoptables, uh, or adoptable, and then I'm going to append an animal. Okay, it's basic, very basic sort of thing. Uh, but I inherit from collection, and the nice thing about inheritance is it allows you to make a promise about the data via the functionality. You're not making a promise about the functionality, mind you. This is where it's easy to make this mistake. We think, oh, that just means it implements iter. No, it means that it is iterable. This is about the data. The data is iterable. Uh, it's also, it, we know that the data has, you know, it contains things. So we can check if something is in the collection. And it has a length, a number of elements. Self.adoptable. All right. So, there we go. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, period that would be great. Okay, so this is just making promises about this constituent data. It is, the data is a collection. That's why we're using the inheritance. So moving on then to the second point before I go any further is brief word about this, this issue of boundaries. Um, Alan Kay said the design should be such that there are clear fences that have to be crossed when serious extensions are made. So he's mainly talking about language design here. This is to the squeak mailing list, but I believe this applies to objects as well. Fences are better than walls in general. And a good example of this was this underscore. There is nothing actually stopping me from being able to go, you know, animal dot notes. I can do that if I want to. Uh, but this underscore indicates I shouldn't be doing that, that this is managed by the class. An object should know how to handle its own data. And that underscore says, hey, I'm managing this. You shouldn't mess with it. But here's the problem. Data hiding, which you see in like Java and C++ or whatever, is usually a mistake. It overcomplicates things. It interferes with extension. It interferes with testing. It interferes with debugging. One of my interns uh, was working in C++, needed to test how um, data was being transformed by a, by a setter into the internal attributes of, of 
of an object um, as part of one of the unit tests and had to work around the data hiding and it was the royal pain. So, you know, in general, data hiding just does not help. Flags are better because it means that you're leaving it up to the user to decide, hey, do I need to cross this boundary? Can be crossed, but they have a warning. They're, you know, taking their, their you know, taking the bugs on themselves at that point. Um, and this is why I prefer this to data mingling. I could do uh, name mingling if with the double underscore at the beginning if I want to, but I really only use this for like critical managed stuff that like there's no conceivable reason why this needs to be accessed. It could really mess things up. I pretty much never do that. Um, in general, don't, don't do that. Okay, so then moving on to the third point here. I think I'm doing all right on time. Uh, behaviors. Uh, this is really the behaviors of the class itself. The key in making great and growable systems, says Alan Kay, is much more to design how its modules communicate rather than what their internal properties and behaviors should be. And again, we saw this with main here. We're thinking about um, how these are communicating with one another rather than thinking about uh, what classes do we want. We figure out the messages first. So I can... I uh, do some of this here. Um, note I haven't really written any getters or setters yet. Well, okay, I kind of have one here. Uh, but, you know, I don't really have many getters or setters. Java would have you write a getter and setter right off the bat uh, and do it for everything. But if you could just access the attribute directly, why bother? Uh, getters and setters have specific purposes. Getters are for data transformation and data filtering. Um. So an example of that would be if we wanted to add a string function to animal, so that way we can print out the animal. Nicely. This string function, I'm just gonna copy from my notes here to save some typing. Okay, so this is just gonna transform um, the name, age, gender, breed, species, and all the notes into a nice little compact string. So this is performing data transformation. It's also technically performing data filtering. We're selecting certain pieces of data to display, although arguably I've displayed them all. Setters, by contrast, are for data validation and data transformation. Example of this is, is adoptables. If I um, have a, um, where's my notes? So if I want to be able to mark an animal as adopted, I have to be able to validate this thing is actually in there. Ask forgiveness, not permission. So I'm going to remove the animal. Um, but, oh, go away. But if, actually, I'm just going to steal this here. If it's not there, then I'm just going to print a nice little error message. And I'm going to need sys for my standard error. So this is a setter because it's performing data validation. Uh, this is an example of performing the transformation because it is uh, taking the information, turning it into something else. In this case, appending it to a collection. Properties should not be counted out. Properties are neat. Um, with, uh, let's see, where was that one? That's on animal. So with this notes thing, property. I like properties because it gives you a nice uniform interface. Instead of having to remember which thing is a setter uh, method that you have to call and which thing is just uh, an attribute, you can just provide what look like attributes and call it good. It doesn't work if you have to pass a bunch of arguments, but in some cases it, it works out really super well. I think this is one of those because maybe this shelter has a policy that you never remove previous notes. Um, I have seen places that do that. Um, you just add new ones. And we're going to transform the data in some fashion, you know, capitalizing the note before appending it to the list of notes. So properties are okay. Um, again, I'm trying to find a, a, a solution, to, a problem to fit the solution, but you get the general idea. Uh, and if we really need to remove from this, we can access notes internally, but I just want to be able to add, add new ones. So you'll see what this looks like. Um, so because I'm kind of running out of time here, I am going to actually just hijack the fully written version of main. So you can just see briefly what I did here. And that is, here we go. So, um, 
most of the time you just see I'm accessing the attributes here, but you know, here's uh here we're creating Fluffy. It's a one-year-old female Maine Coon, hates dogs. We have Butch, a one-year-old male uh, coyote mutt mix. I owned this dog, okay? Coyotes are enthusiastic, friendly, and dumb as rocks. The coyote mixes are just dumb. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to display those animals, and then I'm going to adopt them. So let's see if all went well. Um, uh, it would help if I actually named something. Oh, yes. I actually have to create adoptables. I just need a global instance here. And that should... Yeah, there we go. So you see it prints out the data and then get the payment information, register, etc. Now, I promised really quick. I think I can just get away with this. Um... I promised I would make something immutable, and I'm going to do that with animal, because I want to actually use a set in adoptables rather than a list. But to do that, I need to have it be hashable, and you really don't want it to be hashable unless it's also immutable. So let's do that. So with animal, the way you can do immutability, and immutability is great because it cuts down on your errors, um, changing things that you shouldn't be changing. It's an extra level of, of protection in my mind. So I like immutability. I like to use slots for this. Now, you can just list all of your attributes and call it good. I could just, you know, just do this. And then I could, I like adding weak ref because I like being able to get non-reference counting references, non-counting references. Uh, this would be like fully immutable thing. But I'm going to add in here dictionary as well. So we can add this notes and this age because those two things are going to change, but the rest of these things should not be changing. So this is going to be partially immutable. Leave off dictionary and make sure all your attributes are in there if you want it fully immutable. Um, and then I'm going to do set adder, self name value. And the way this works, there's a bunch of different ways people do this, but the, my personal favorite ways you check if the attribute is already there. Um, and then you also check if it is found in slots. Um, if it is already there and is found in slots, then you raise this attribute error. Otherwise, you call object set adder. Now, here's the thing. Some smart alecs like to point out that this is not actually immutable because you can always use set adder externally to override this. Yes, true. But if you're going to do that, you deserve whatever bugs you're going to get. You know, Python's all about fences rather than walls. We are all intelligent adults. Uh, if you're going to bypass things, maybe you have a good reason. Testing, you know, for example, being able to, you know, inject something during debugging or whatever. But most of the time, you just shouldn't be doing that. We also need delete adder. I have actually never seen anyone do this outside of a, a set adder. So <laughs> this is just wrong. Okay. Um... All right, and then if we're going to do this, I'm going to go ahead and hash. Make it hashable and comparable. I'm not going to go over that, but uh, we're going to make it make it hashable, make it comparable with one another. Because I've done this, then I can change one thing here. I can change this to a set, and it still works. We can still add notes, and yet the rest of this is actually immutable. So, like, name, gender, breed, and species cannot be changed once it's defined, and if I try... I can just say, uh, Butch, maybe he gets a, maybe someone wants to give him a tougher name. He says, oh, let's name him Butcher instead, you know, and now I'm going to get an attribute error. It's read only. So effectively immutable. It's as close as Python will let you get to immutable without, you know, actually inheriting from a name tuple or some such horror, but there you have it. So, um, I am going to be taking questions in a sec, but I want to make sure, and I have all of this on GitHub, like I said, including the principles here. Um, you design the behavior of the code first. Classes are not an organizational structure. They're units of state or messages, and they're defined by their constituent data. Uh, constituent data is going to inform the structure. Does it actually have to be a class? Could it be something else? And if you use inheritance, that should be extending the meaning, not the behavior. Uh, boundaries, data hiding is usually a mistake. Just use flags. An object should know how to handle its own data, but a user is probably a better expert than you on whether or not they need to get around the fences. Uh, getters are for data transformation and data filtering. Setters are for data validation and data transformation. If it's just a bare getter or setter, except in the, that one weird case of properties, just don't write getters or setters. 
Traits of, consist of constituent data define the behavior. So things like special methods, is it iterable, mathematical, comparable, um, immutable? You know, these things are determined by the data. So anyway, that is, uh, I believe, how object-oriented programming is supposed to work. And the cool thing is it's completely compatible with functional paradigms. Um, so you don't lose your mind as much. So I think I have a couple of minutes for questions here before I have to turn this over. Yeah, um, I, hey, uh, by the way, thanks, thanks for the talk. And <laughs> you, so you didn't have to uh, give sacrifices to the demo gods, but you have a lot of animals no. in there. So maybe they were happy with that. <laughs> uh, we, we don't have a real question here yet, but we have at least somebody who has to admit that uh, uh, you managed to hurt his head. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> So Richard, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, it I, didn't hurt too much. Yeah, yeah. The, the property is kind of an unusual thing. It's fairly controversial. But if, if if people don't agree with my use of properties, they can throw that out and keep the rest. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, well, we we did the practice on yesterday, and I I thought when when you watch this for the first time, you really get a bit confused. So it's worth just looking it up again and playing it at your own speed to just find out what you just learned. Uh, here's a question. Oh, nice. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Uh, any favorite resources in uh, OOP in Python you recommend? <laughs> Mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally blunt. The whole reason I wrote Dead Simple Python is because I had a really hard time finding good resources that explained some of these inner workings. I mean, a, a lot of this came out of, um, you know, Dead Simple Python. I was researching the inner workings of how things were actually being assigned and how an inheritance was working, method resolution order, and all this jazz. And that really changed how I was thinking about objects. Uh, because I was coming from other languages, you know, other object-oriented programming languages originally, where it was kind of more the university Java style, and that's what I was used to. And then I realized that Python does not work that way, and arguably none of the other languages should either. Even if they do have data hiding, that whole university Java style is kind of backwards. So once I understood how Python did things, then idiomatic patterns became more obvious, and then that, those kind of got retroactively, you know, worked their way into my... Uh, my C++ style. Hmm. We have time for one more question. This time, the, this time a real question from Richard. Uh, would you not also use a private flag and property to implement effective immutability? Well, you could, but I would say that's more managed than immutable. Immutable means that once it's defined, that it's not going to change in memory. And um, you know, granted, what I have is is effective immutability because there is that workaround. But the difference is that. You know, because you can, because you actually get an attribute error when changing on an immutable or an effective immutable, and that's what you want. You want an attribute error. So um, having the property really just gives you managed data, like I have with notes, um, but it's not going to give you um, the same sort of thing. Now, I will say really quick that you can. Um, you don't actually have to define the uh, the initial values of all of these things in your initializer when you're doing this this you know this immutable thing I have. It it doesn't wait for it just to be initialized there. It's once there's any value assigned to whatever your immutable, you know, whatever your slot value is. Once there's a value, then it can never be changed. So you can assign it one time. Um, so how you use that is up to you. But yeah, I want to make sure it's clear there's a difference between immutable and managed. Okay, thank you very much. I think we don't have any more time for question. But, I'll be in uh, Discord. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you could go over to Discord uh, or follow the next talk here. Uh, thanks again, Jason. Thank you. Bye. And so uh, I'm just going to invite Chuck to come, come in again. Uh, and she's going to take over presenting now um, from me. Uh, so I think you have endured me long enough. And also, the next talk is done by another Martin, but uh, Chok will tell you about that. <laughs> so, Chok, take over. Right. So, um, yeah. So, well, Martin, do you, you want to go or you want to stay? You can stay. I don't mind. Yeah, yeah stay for a few Martin, more seconds, yeah. but I will not press any more <laughs> buttons. <laughs> 
uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so we will have our next speaker is also called Martin. <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, uh, I'll tell you a fun story. The first time I met them is actually at a Euro Python in Basel, I believe. And uh, so we had a had a lunch together, and then both of them show up, and they both introduce themselves as Martin. I was a bit confused, but <laughs> yes, hi Martin. Yay. Hi there. Hi there. Hi, Joe. And hi, Martin. Long time not seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so Martin is uh, the organizer of GeoPython, and also he is. Uh, well, I think your area is mostly GeoPython, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, GeoPython, and of course, EuroPython, and many other things. Yeah, so uh, maybe you have already seen Martin in another conference because I know that he presented in a lot of different conferences. And um, so, yeah. Uh, oh, Orca is here as well. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, now uh, it's getting crowded. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, going to say goodbye. <laughs> okay. So, okay. We only have one Martin left. So, yeah, uh, Martin, uh, if you're ready, then uh, I would show your presentation and you can take us away. I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> Good. So I'm talking about Python. I do a little bit introduction in a few modules. Um, I will just show the uh, Jupyter um, lab or Jupyter notebook here. And everything I show is on GitHub. So the link is um, here. Um, you can actually, I will put it in the chat later too. So the first thing always, if you use Geo modules, um, unfortunately, they don't come installed with Conda, for example. So we have to manually install them. And um, it's very important to create uh, an environment for them, because if you try to install it in the base, you will probably fail. So here is uh, the recipe to install everything, uh, creating the uh, pajamas environment, for example. And the second drawback is Geo modules is also uh, they're a little bit behind in version. You can't use Python 3.9 um, or 8 um, at the moment. You have to stick with 3.7 for a while. Always go um, two versions um, down, then you are quite safe. The reason for that is um, this module, actually uh, Rasterio, which depends on GDAL, and GDAL is really a, a tough um, thing to compile and, and have it ready for all the platforms, including Mac OS or Linux, etc. Also Windows, of course. Even on Windows, it's really hard to, to get this um, done. So after installation, um, this takes a couple minutes. Um, yeah, actually, I did it this way. So you have the pajamas environment. So um, I also installed JupyterLab. So you activate it. You, you start JupyterLab with this environment. And that's what you get. Uh, and the first module I want to show you is called Shapely. Um, Shapely, here is the documentation of it basically supports um, something called um, simple feature access. It's a standard to represent points, line strings, polygons, etc. So of course, points, simple, polygons, um, not that simple. Line strings, there are two, um, two versions. One is this line string here. And the second one, I didn't make a graphics of that one, is the so-called linear ring. Um, that's just the same one, just closed. Um, polygons are always closed, of course, and you can't have special cases um, of polygons. Um, only uh, this kind of polygons are allowed. You can't, for example, have intersections in the polygons. If, if you have something like that, you have to create two polygons, and then you have a so-called multi-polygon. So we have, um, from every geometry here, we have a multi-representation. So we have multi-line strings, multi-points, and multi-polygons, um, and so on. And uh, what I forgot to mention is, of course, you can also have polygons with one or more holes. Um, many countries, for example, they, they have some, some sort of, of enclaves. For, Switzerland, for example, has two enclaves, so we need those holes. So that's basically it. So let's construct something using Shapely. What I did, I, I could actually do something, uh, just draw something, um, digitize the points and create my polygon. I created a hexagon just for fun, um, 60 degree. Um, and some 
sinus, cosine, cosine, voodoo, and then you get um, the, the hexagon. So let me execute that. You see the first point. I made a radius of 10, so it's it's okay from the size. And okay, these are the, the points of the hexagon. And something important, if, if we define a um, polygon in Shapely, the first and the last point must be the same. So we, we have to add uh, the first point at the end. Again, I just do that with appending the, the first coordinate. And um, so now we, we actually have the first and the last point um, uh, defined as with the same coordinates. If this is not the same coordinate, then we can't really um, create what we do now. There will put be an error. So I import shapely geometry, and inside that is the class polygon. Um, you can use the same for the other things. For example, you could um, write um, a, a, a point or line string, linear ring, etc., and just do that um, here. Okay, so that's done. We have the coordinates, so let's construct this polygon. So I import it, I create my hexagon out of these coordinates, yeah, and then I can display it directly in, in uh, Jupyter. So this is um, our hexagon. There is no coordinate axis here, and there, with the scale, it, it's it's used for debugging mostly. This this view here. Don't don't use that if you want to see it uh, really uh, uh, with the dimension and the size, etc. So we can call some things like the length or era, etc. There are many other um, things you can do with those um, geometries. Um, but let's create another polygon, um, something simple like a triangle. So I create this triangle um, with some coordinates. It's just inside this this polygon from the coordinates. And if we uh, output it now, we see um, this one is much smaller than this um, hexagon, and it's it's displayed with a wrong with really a, a wrong scale. So what we can do is we can use matplotlib to have a correct scale. Then you just uh, use the exterior. That's the most simple way. There are other ways you can um, use uh, some some shapes in, in matplotlib too. I'm not going to do that now. I'm just um, drawing my two polygons here. So the hexagon and the triangle. And we see the triangle as promised is inside this hexagon. So what we can do now from Shapely, we can call some functions like the difference. So I take the hexagon, I take the difference and this argument triangle, and then I get a new representation. That's a new uh, shape. We can also do an intersection, union, difference, and symmetric difference. I, I will show you the difference between difference and symmetric difference in a, in a second. Um, but let's just do that. Um, I will move this triangle a little bit more outside because it's not, not fun to have an intersection if, if we have a triangle inside. So I move this uh, triangle to be around here. And let's do the difference. And you see, no, it's not Pac-Man, but something similar. You see here is this part of the triangle, which is a little bit moved here. So we get a new shape if I take the difference. I can also take the intersection of the both. Then I get a triangle. However, this is this, of course, the intersection is this, this um, part here is this triangle. So that's the intersection. I can um, make the union here. I can um, have the symmetric difference. And now if we take the symmetric difference, we see I get this one. And uh, it's just uh, another kind of difference. Um, the symmetric difference just um, takes away the intersection between the two shapes. And this one is a little bit special because this one is not one polygon. This one is uh, the result of here. It's a multi-polygon. So we have actually two polygons next to each other. Now we can um, write the well-known text out of it. We can store it as a new shape, of course, or just see how it looks like. And this representation is called well-known text. Here's a link if you are interested in that. You can look at that. I can actually quickly open it. You see some examples of polygons, how they are defined with this text-based representation. You can even load this again using this text. I'm not going to show that uh, now, but it, it's, a, it's a nice representation to have a text-based um, result out of it because text is, is in the geo world still a very important thing. Um, because it can't be printed, so you can print out your, your polygons and you keep it. That's, for example, important for 
country borders, so you can actually print them on old-fashioned paper if you if you still think that's important. There are also some binary operations on shapes. I just show you this quickly. There are something like contains, intersects, within, equal. I just show you this triangle intersects, intersects the, the hexagon, and this result, of course, is true. And uh, we could do that also with within. You can also uh, specify points inside polygons and all these things. What I wanted to show you now is, of course, this this Shapely uh, library, and um, and this Shapely library is is um, is used by many other um, modules. It's actually um, uh, quite a popular thing um, based on Geos, the geometry engine open source, which is written in C, but I'm not going too much into this detail now. If you're interested in Shapely, you can um, check the documentation. I show you one more thing. Um, it comes with many, many, many different operations. And one um, uh, very important um, thing is triangulation. And if I take this hexagon, I triangulate it, I can specify some tolerance, and I can specify if I want to return a polygon or a line string. So if I do that, I get uh, four triangles, actually polygons, but it's it's now four triangles. And I can just display them with matplotlib, and we see this hexagon or whatever shape um, I use is triangulated. So that's really quite handy if you need some triangulation uh, algorithm. As I said, there is much more in Shapely, um, but of course, um, due to the limited time of this presentation, I can't show you all. Okay, so, um, oh, I think this one is, again, I don't know why I put that, that's actually a mistake. So, there is one more thing. Um, we can uh, convert this Shapely geometry to well-known text, and we can also convert it to something called GeoJSON. GeoJSON is a very popular format to represent um, geometry, to put it on maps. That's why it's called mapping in, in a Shapely. So this one is a GeoJSON representation. So we just um, remember that just uh, in contrary to the polygon, uh, to this well-known text, polygon, etc. Same coordinates, of course, but it's a different representation. This GeoJSON is important. We will come back to that soon. The second module I show you today is Folium. Folium is used to um, create web maps. It's based on the Leaflet.js, so JavaScript library, but it has a, has a, a Pythonic interface and with two lines of code, actually, um, one line of code and the import, more or less. I could skip this. Um, M here. Uh, we can open a map. This one is a geographic coordinate. I will show you how it's uh, created in an instant. A volume also supports some thing called markers where we can put some markers here. Just add those markers to the map a position here and add what, what's here. I took two hotels in Zurich. And um, yeah, I can also change this icon. Um, I'm not going to show you the details here, but we could make um, icons here um, using Font Awesome. So you can have the Font Awesome. You could actually uh, change that, for example, to beer, and then you would have an uh, icon here with this beer symbol. There are hundreds of different um, icons available in Font Awesome. You can also export this uh, created map to uh, HTML. Um, we'll show up here, this map. I have to trust this one is just HTML, basically, this map. This is quite handy if if you um, have a web service, for example, and you want to create maps with, with a search result, for example, or something like that. And um, yeah. Okay, so let's take our hexagon from before and put this one on the map. You remember I stored this as GeoJSON. Actually, let me show that quickly again. Um, GeoJSON, it was this one here. Um, and um, that's our hexagon in the GeoJSON format. And now Folium supports GeoJSON with the Folium GeoJSON um, function. And we can have our hexagon here. 
maybe you wonder why it's located here because we use geographic coordinates the center is zero zero so um yeah that's zero zero here and we had 10 degrees distance and as promised uh, the geographic coordinates zero zero is here um plus 90 degrees would be here and plus 90 in uh, latitude would be uh, on top here and minus 90 down here so it goes from minus 180 to plus 180 degree and this represents our our map okay so much about this uh, map things so let me show you another uh, module called geopandas but first let me use pandas i have a csv data set here of all cities or big cities with a population of 5000 um, this one was downloaded from geonames.org so uh, i can just open that with Geopandas, we see that um, uh, it's too many columns. So let me just uh, reduce. I give the co some columns a name and I reduce that one to the most important columns. So we have the name of the city, we have the latitude, longitude of the city, we have a population of the city and the type of the city. This type is actually um, at the kind of, of place. It's documented in geonames. I'm not going into details here. We can do standard panda things here, for example. Um, query Paris, we see there are many different Paris here. So let me um, convert this that only the, the PPLX things are the, the main uh, cities are in this data frame and uh, here only the main cities are, are here. So I remove this, these things. And um, now I can create a so-called GeoPandas data frame. Uh, basically, a very simple set, GeoPandas is just pandas with a, a column called geometry. And this geometry column contains um, a shapely geometry. So what I have to do is I have to um, convert this one in this case because it's not a geo format. So I create a point. This is a shapely point, so a shapely geometry point. And I use longitude latitude out of it and just create a column out of that one and set the geometry of the geodata frame to this geometry. It takes a couple um, of microseconds, whatever. And um, now we have this um, geopandas data frame with the you see a point um, inside. So let me drop that long because we don't need that one anymore. And what I can do now is um, just, um, yeah, I, I, actually I can plot this, this um, the points quickly. So we see in the data set, we have all the, the places here um, from this data set. Um, we recognize some, some things of the earth. So let me create a point. Um, I'm located in Basel, Switzerland at the moment. So uh, I create a point with the coordinate of Basel. That's the longitude and then the latitude. Be careful about the order. For example, volume um, requires it differently. So first the latitude, then the longitude. Um, and most other libraries use the longitude first and then the latitude. So that's um, yeah, how it is. So I can uh, calculate distance to this point. So uh, this one is a new row, actually, this. And I can just put it as a row in GeoPandas and um, display that one. Let me actually display that um, here first. And we see this one. Um, is is now here distance just this is just distance to to Basel and we can actually um, sort to that and we see this these places are the most uh, the closest one to Basel so such uh, qu uh, queries are possible of course something very easy um, because we have pandas functionality we can do some normal pandas thing so let me get all cities um, with a population greater than five million and with a quick uh, conversion, I can um, put them on volume, just going with, with apply um, functionality here in pandas or geopandas. I create a marker on my map, and then I just put the, the cities, our big cities here on the map. You see, of course, in China, we have many big cities. So uh, yeah, I can click here and see the population. Okay, so um, here, uh, quick, I have four minutes left, so I have to hurry a little bit. Um, I can also download some live data. For example, here, I download the GeoJSON from the 
USGS Earthquake dataset, which is located here. So I can just download that one using requests. Um, it should be here. Um, uh, the, and here, as we see, the GeoJSON with all the earthquake information. Oh, let me go down. And I can just import that one as GeoPandas file, so with, with read file. GeoJSON is directly supported. Um, and if I display the head, I see this one is GeoJSON imported. Again, let me simplify it to the uh, columns which are the most important for us at the moment. So we have a timestamp, we have magnitude, we have place, and here we see the geometry. Um, there is something I didn't mention before. We have a point Z because we have a three-dimensional coordinate. Here is the Z um, value, which is uh, in meters, um, usually. Yeah, OK. So let me convert quickly. I can make a histogram here. This is basic panda stuff. So we see, luckily, we don't have really big earthquakes at the moment. Uh, so that's a good thing. One thing, one pandemic is enough. We don't want earthquakes now. So I can convert this timestamp to a more readable um, time. So we see this is um, uh, from December 5, so quite um, new data. And we can actually remove the timestamp here and then plot the the earthquakes. However, this is not nice because uh, just earthquakes without a map in the background um, is, is not what I really want. So let me read this data set here. It's from Natural Earth. Um, it's, it's a public domain data set which contains all countries uh, stored as a so-called shapefile. So I can, again, with Geopan, just read that one. And now, um, with, with matplotlib in the background of GeoPandas, I can just plot this one, store it, and use it as axis in the earthquake plot. So I can combine these two. And we see here countries black and the, the earthquakes red. I don't know why I chose these colors. doesn't really matter. If you want to display them with a different size, um, I mean, if you have a, a larger magnitude and have a bigger dot here, then we should use Geoplot or another library, which is better suitable for, for this kind of visualization. I'm not showing that because I'm already running out of time. So well, let's quickly sort this. And what was the biggest earthquake recently? Yeah, 6.4. Um, this is UTC, so a couple hours ago in Alaska. So that and one in Russia. So. 6.4 is quite um, high, but not that high. So um, I remember one time I had this in the presentation, and then there was a, a magnitude 8 just a couple of minutes before I made this presentation. That was quite um, quite bad, yeah. OK, so uh, some more GeoPanda stuff. Um, you can try this yourself with plotting. I'm skipping this because I'm running out of time. I show you one last thing with Rust data. Um, there's a module uh, called Rustereo. It's based on GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, which is a C library, a very popular and very old C library. And Rustereo is a Pythonic interface to it. GDAL itself also has a Python binding, but it's really um, too close to C. Um, it's nicer to use Rustereo. So you can open a, a image, so a raster image. In this case, we have um, three so-called bands. There are some hyperspectral bands of satellite imagery. They have more than three um, so-called bands. But here is just RGB, um, and we have a width and height. It's a quite small picture. We have a so-called coordinate reference system. This means it's in geographic coordinates in WGS84. Um, and then we can check the bounds of this. So we see it's, it covers the whole Earth. There is a so-called transform, where we can transform pixels to the coordinates. So for example, if we take pixel 0, 0, it would be minus 180, 90 degree. So it's uh, top left. And we can do the inverse. So we can um, transform uh, a geographic coordinate to pixel. So we, if we take this point from before in, in Africa, it's in the middle of, of the image. Remember, it was 3618, so it's in the middle exactly. And then we can take, let me take this um, 
uh, my coordinate where I'm uh, located at the moment. Um, so this one would be the pixel coordinate of this. Okay, we, we can cut, uh, we can cut this one and convert to integer or round it up, doesn't really matter because the image is so, so small. Uh, we don't even need to round here. So let me read all the data, um, RGB, and then with NumPy, I can uh, call the DStack, so I can create um, RGB um, triples out of it, because in Rasteria, we only read bands uh, separately. This, this is very important if you have hyperspectral data, for example, and you can just plot it using um, imshow from um, matplotlib, and we see here the image and this one. Of course, we can do much more. We can, now we have the pixels. We could um, do some some uh, other calculations. It's just nice to have a quick way to present this. So uh, I'm a little bit over time already. Um, one small thing, something very new. I'm the organizer of a GeoPython conference. We just really recently decided to um, make a second online edition next year. GeoPython 2021 will be in April, end of April next year. If you're interested, you can uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, there is also a register interest button here. Um, and this is our new, every is, is the six, already number six of GeoPython conference. Every year we have a new um, logo here, and this one is quite the latest edition. Um, the web page is um, currently under construction, so um, you can go there, but it will just go to this register interest page at the moment. Okay, so thanks for your interest, and I have hopefully time for questions now. Yeah, thank you, Martin. That's Amazing, that's great. So uh, there is one question in the chat. So uh, Frankie asked, does Folium have the ability to use dynamic element or do I have to, uh, do I have to use native leaflet JS to do so? In other words, without reacting the entire map. Yeah, exactly. There is, um, actually it's in, in Folium, it's not um, possible. There is another module for uh, Leaflet. It's it's uh, integration into, into um, I think I made the installation here too. I'm not sure if I deleted it. No, I actually removed it. There is a, a integration for um, JupyterLab. It's Pi uh, Leaflet something, I have to look it up. Um, this is more dynamic, but um, Folium itself is not dynamic. So um, unfortunately, um, it's really static. It's more for creating static maps, and you can't have moving uh, things in in this one. But as I said, there is this other module, Pi Leaflet something, uh, which is a, a extension to Jupyter. I, I don't really like it too much in a certain way because my productive stuff doesn't really run in Jupyter. So you know what I mean. So I, I usually uh, stick with Folium because of that. Uh, or I would use native JavaScript. Right. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And then a really good uh, sneaky ad at the end for GeoPython. And actually, uh, I think it's a very good advertisement. And uh, maybe I will open a channel called Events Yet to Come uh, on this call. So maybe Martin, you can share more information about it so uh, people mm -hmm. know about it. That so great. yeah, just uh, hang out in this call. And I, I believe that people may want to have a discussion or ask you questions uh, with you. So yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.